This series is about the Pacific Ocean and the people who live around it and across its vast expanse. From the first men and women to see this ocean to their descendants down to the present day. It involves physical evolution and cultural change. How men and women and children learned over an enormous period of time to adapt to an amazing variety of constantly changing environments. This series is about how half the world's people came to be the way they are. But above all, the human story on this side of the globe is about migration. And it began in the mainland in the southwestern corner people moving out, occupying all the islands of Southeast Asia, on into Australia, north into Siberia, and across into North and Central and South America, and finally across the myriad of tiny islands on the face of the Pacific itself. All of these lands were occupied by people migrating out from Asia. That movement began more than 50,000 years ago and it started a process of extraordinary adaptations to the sea because most of these places could only be reached across water. How were these first sea journeys made? What sort of watercraft did they use? Surprisingly, I think some of the answers can still be found here on the south coast of China. The first human sea journeys of any significance took place in this part of the world. Not just to the thousands of small islands off the Asian mainland, from Siberia all the way down to Indonesia, but as far out as Japan, the Philippines, New Guinea and Australia. And they probably began from places like this, beaches on the south coast of China, and on simple watercraft like this bamboo raft that fishermen still use today. We'll never know precisely what those first watercraft were like because they were made of perishable materials and they've rotted away. But it is possible to imagine that once these early people found they could cross rivers or lakes or go along the coast on mats of vegetation or floating logs, they would very quickly have learned how to make their own watercraft, simple rafts. And the obvious material for them to use that's widespread across Asia and ideal for their purpose is bamboo. Bamboo is ideal for simple watercraft. It's light and very strong. Each built-in airtight compartment gives it buoyancy. Strips of the outer skin make good lashings. A bamboo raft is so simple to make. These rafts will last for years, as long as they're taken out of the water frequently to kill borers. This is just a small raft, but even so, the fishermen often go to sea in these for a week or more. And 20 years ago in this area, there were much larger ocean-going cargo rafts. They were up to seven metres long and could carry several tonnes of cargo. It's likely that modern Chinese junks developed from bamboo rafts. 
Perhaps the ancient sailors added extra pieces to the sides of their rafts and gradually turned them into bigger and more sophisticated vessels. But the qualities of bamboo were not forgotten. The junk still has a series of watertight compartments and a rounded bottom without a keel, just like a piece of bamboo. The big question is, could a simple bamboo raft have made major ocean crossings as much as 50,000 years ago? I believe they not only could, but did. Things like rafts don't show up in archaeological excavations, and they probably never will. So it's hard to know what the earliest ones were like. The only way to get any idea is to build one and sail it yourself. A few years ago, I had a bamboo raft made in Indonesia. The bamboo was grown by village people in the hills near Jakarta. Cutting and selling bamboo is their business. They make huge rafts of bamboo and float them down the river to market. For my experiment, they took a load of bamboo to a group of islands out in the Java Sea. It was here that I found out how easy it is to design a large raft and lash it together. We made a simple mast, also of bamboo. The ropes and rigging were woven from vines and bark. The sail was a pair of pandanus palm sleeping mats that I bought in a market and sewed together. The whole thing took only a couple of hours to make. The raft was very stable in the water, but it took a while to get used to. Because the bamboo lengths are flexible, the whole platform bends in the waves. It's like having built-in shock absorbers, and really very smooth sailing. Even in light winds and with our makeshift sail, the raft moved along quite easily, and we made the first island in half an hour. In the open sea, with stronger winds, we moved much faster. We'll never know exactly how the first ocean crossing was made, but this experiment proved to me that it could have happened with watercraft as simple as this bamboo raft. 
And there was one other very important factor which would have made these first open sea voyages much less dangerous than they are today. The distances they had to sail were much less because the sea levels at that time were much lower. When we look at a map of the Pacific Ocean, we often forget that because sea levels have fluctuated considerably in the past, the outlines of the land masses around the Pacific have been changing, sometimes very dramatically. The Huon Peninsula in the northeast corner of New Guinea is one of the very few places where you can actually see the evidence for this and get some idea of just how big these sea level changes really were. Each of these horizontal terraces is a fringing coral reef developed at a particular sea level in the past. When the sea rose or fell, a new reef was formed. By dating the corals in each of these terraces, it's possible to estimate the levels of the sea at different periods in the past. This gigantic staircase of terraces, there are dozens of them here, are visible now because the whole area is very active geologically. And the entire Huon Peninsula has been raised up out of the sea so that we can see this pattern of sea level changes that goes back more than 300,000 years. The reason for the changes in sea level was the Ice Age. A great deal of water was locked up in the ice caps at the North and South Poles. And because of this, world sea levels were as much as 150 metres, nearly 500 feet, lower. This is what the Pacific Ocean looked like when the sea level was 150 metres lower. Additional land was exposed everywhere, but South America looked much the same. In North America, there was no Hudson's Bay, and no Bering Strait either, because Siberia and North America were one continuous landmass. But it's in Asia and Southeast Asia that you can really see some differences. Taiwan and Japan were part of the east coast of Asia. Some of the Philippine islands were fused together. The Malay Peninsula, Sumatra, Java and Borneo were all part of the Asian mainland. New Guinea, Australia and Tasmania were a single landmass. With the shrunken South China Sea, any human movements, especially by sea, would have been less risky. Getting from China to Australia would have been much easier and I believe people did move down through here by different routes into Australia. It was on a tropical coastline like this, more than 50,000 years ago, that the first raft, or something very similar, made its final landfall, completing the last giant step from Asia to Australia. Of course, it wasn't a single voyage by a single raft. It probably took thousands of years, people moving from island to island, generations of people slowly moving on until finally one group, perhaps a family, saw Australia for the first time. And since then, countless other voyages have come from the northwest, out of the sunset, to land on beaches just like this, right across northern Australia. The island continent was empty and ready for settlement, but it was the end of the line for that human migration. For people on this side of the Pacific, Australia was as far south as you could go. Those first Australians were part of an extraordinary human explosion out of Asia that drove people not just through the islands of Southeast Asia, but north into Siberia, across North America, and down to Terra del Fuego, the freezing tip of South America, and finally, right across the Pacific itself. Who were these conquerors of half the planet? 
Where did they come from? And how did they evolve from those shadowy people who first walked the jungles of Asia? To find out, we need to go back in time to look for the people who made the Pacific's first footsteps. The original home of humans, the place where we evolved, is in Africa. That was around two million years ago, and very soon after that, early humans began to spread out, out of Africa, into Europe, and toward Asia. They reached Southeast Asia something like one and a half million years ago. Ironically, it was here, not in Africa, that the first fossils of these earliest humans was found, by a Dutchman, Eugene Dubois. Dubois was born the year before Darwin's Origin of Species was published. He grew up at a time when evolutionary theory was shaking classical ideas about geology and biology. He collected fossils as a boy and entered medical school when he was 19. Dubois' generation of medical students was the first to feel the impact of evolution. He was one who came to firmly believe in it. Dubois finished his degree and began teaching anatomy, but soon decided that he would rather search for fossils of early humans. He enlisted in the Dutch Foreign Service as a surgeon, and in 1887 he sailed for the Dutch East Indies, now Indonesia. So that he could search full-time, Dubois had himself put in charge of a fossil survey, with convict labourers to do the digging. Many parts of Indonesia were still quite wild, and Dubois learned a lot about the tropics and its wildlife. In his search for fossils, Dubois was helped by the tropical downpours that came every year with the monsoon. The flooding caused massive erosion. The villagers often found things washed out by the rain when they were digging in the fields and rice paddies. In some places, especially in Java, fossils were very common. Pieces of giant extinct animals dating back half a million years or more. Buffalo horns, teeth of tigers and early rhinos, elephant tusks, crocodile skulls, giant thigh bones. These were interesting, but Dubois was looking for something very special. Something no one had ever seen before. The remains of a creature somewhere between humans and all the other primates. The missing link. And that search eventually led Dubois to a place called Trinil, beside the Solo River. Of all the places he could have gone to, why did Dubois come here? Well, he felt, as Darwin had, that if there was a link between humans and apes, the evidence for it would be found in the tropics either in Africa, where there are gorillas and chimpanzees, or in Southeast Asia, where there are gibbons and orangutans. Dubois chose to come to Southeast Asia because Holland had a colony here, the Dutch East Indies. He went first to Sumatra and looked for fossils there, but didn't find anything very significant, so he came across here to Java. It's really extraordinary, but within two years of getting off the ship from Holland, he found exactly what he was looking for, one of the most important fossils ever discovered. This simple marker points to where he found it. J. 
Just over there on the bank of the Solo River, Dubois found a skull cap. This is a cast of it, the original still in Holland. It was the top part of the skull, from the brow ridges to the back of the head. It was obviously human, but clearly different from modern people like ourselves. That was in 1891, and it was a critical discovery, because by then many people had got used to the idea of evolution and were prepared to believe that plants and animals had evolved through change and adaptation. But here was the first hard evidence that humans had also reached their present form by the same process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, without the down. Yeah. Yeah. Professor Teku Yakob of the University of Gajamada in Yogyakarta yeah. is Indonesia's leading fossil okay. specialist. Mm. You now you see here the most complete one. Mm. Uh, Especially at the base, yes. Dubois called his discovery Pithecanthropus erectus, or upright ape man. But later discoveries have made it clear that these people were in fact our immediate ancestors. Java man is now called Homo erectus, upright man, the first true human. These were the first humans to live in Asia. Homo erectus remains have now been found in India, Europe and Africa, but the area where Dubois made his historic find is still producing fossils. A third of all the Homo erectus fossils found worldwide come from Java. Although Homo erectus skulls are clearly different from ours, Dubois' ape men were fully human, not ape-like at all. Below the neck, their bodies were the same as ours. They were hunter-gatherers, gathering wild foods in the forest, foraging beside streams and along the coast, gradually learning how to tackle some of the bigger game that roamed Ice Age Indonesia. Then, the dragons that are now found only on Komodo Island were everywhere. While Homo erectus people were living in Indonesia, other groups like them were moving on to other parts of mainland Asia, along the coast and further inland, much further north. This is the Huang He, China's legendary Yellow River, that gets its name from the sediment it carries and dumps to make such fertile plains. This area was one of the first places that humans changed from hunting and gathering to life in settled communities. But of course, China's human story goes back much further, perhaps a million years to Homo erectus times. There were people here like Java Man, yet different enough to show they were developing in another direction. The first idea of what they were like came from one of the most famous archaeological excavations of all time. It began in the north, near Beijing, in 1927, at a place called Dragonbone Hill. Dragonbone Hill, in Chinese, Jogodian, is a rocky outcrop in limestone hills, 50 kilometres from China's capital, Beijing. The limestone is riddled with caves and fissures that have been filled up with gravel, and rocks and animal fossils. These fossils are the dragon bones that the Chinese for centuries have dug out and ground up to use in traditional medicine. Fossil hunters began to excavate these bones in the early 1920s. Among all the thousands of bones were two human-like teeth. They were recognised by the Professor of Anatomy at the Peking Medical School, a Canadian named Davidson Black. The remains soon came to be known as Peking Man. In 1927, Black organised major excavations at Jogodien with a large team of scientists and workers. After 10 years, a huge cave had been dug out, producing the remains of 20 skulls and jaws, 
more than a hundred teeth and bones. Gialan Poe was one of the scientists who worked on the excavation, and he took these photographs of the work there. Today, Professor Jiao is one of China's most senior and respected archaeologists, the last survivor of those historic excavations. This is main cave. Right. So are those fireplaces there? Yeah. This is uh, actually so-called hardened tool. Cross hardened tool. Right. Yeah. The finds at Jiao Dian show that people began living in the cave half a million years ago. They were hunter-gatherers and collected seeds and fruits and hunted a wide range of animals, including deer, ostriches, pigs and rabbits. They made stone tools and probably used animal skins for clothing in the winter. That was a cave there. And what about these? Were the, I mean, they're the two ash layers up there. This is uh, ash layer, first, uh, first, first layer. And this uh, bit, yes, ash in there. Ash there. Yeah. And this one too. Also. Oh, always. Oh, oh, uh, I can see oh, it up yeah, there. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that's all you can find fire some place material. black colour. Yeah. Among the most important finds were the fireplaces and baked hearths. These ancient campfires are probably the earliest evidence yet found of the human use of fire. There are many reasons why this is one of the world's greatest archaeological sites, why the cave of Peking Man has excited the imagination of people everywhere. But for me, there's one overriding consequence of the discoveries made here. With the sheer mass of evidence, we could be sure that the inhabitants of this cave were unquestionably human, and that humans had slowly but surely changed, physically and culturally, over something like a quarter of a million years. In other words, they had evolved and evolved in the direction of modern people. And that was solid support for the theory of evolution. After the discoveries made here in Dragonbone Hill, no one could seriously doubt that humans, like animals and plants, had appeared in their present form through the same process of evolution. And the significance of that was not just Asian, but global. The Peking Man site was a remarkable discovery. But Chinese archaeological finds over the last 40 years have expanded their collection of human fossils into what is now the best and most continuous record for any part of the world, and it spans more than a million years. To see it all laid out like this in the Academy of Sciences Institute in Beijing, where the fossils are kept and studied, is to see the evidence for a huge slice of human evolution. It puts the Peking man fossils in perspective and it's also a chance to see the sort of materials that anthropologists use to reconstruct the human past and just how difficult that is. So let's start at the beginning. The oldest human fossils from China are these. Two teeth from Yunnan in the extreme south of China and they're probably more than a million years old. They're the teeth are two upper central incisors and they're shovel shaped that is behind they're curved and we'll see later this is very significant and then there's the skull and jaw from Lantian in central China Lantian is clearly Homo erectus and very similar in many ways to Java man but different enough to show that already China and Java were going in separate directions And next, there's Peking Man himself. 
This is just a small selection of the enormous range of materials that was found at the site. Most of them, of course, are casts because the originals were lost during the war. Although there are some fossils, like these ones, that are originals found during the last 40 years by Chinese anthropologists. I mean, there's no question, it's just an extraordinary range of material and easily the best for any Homo erectus site anywhere in the world. And this is a reconstruction of what Peking man probably looked like. There's another slightly later Homo erectus skull. And then this almost complete skull from Dali near Xi'an, not far from where the entombed warriors come from. This is a most important specimen because in a number of anatomical details about the face and the brows and the brain case, it shows clearly the transition from Homo erectus through into Homo sapiens. Then still later, there are these fragmentary finds from various parts of China. Isolated teeth, part of an upper jaw, part of the back of a skull, and here part of a lower jaw. They show very clearly how difficult it is to put together the jigsaw puzzle, the enormous jigsaw puzzle, really, that is human evolution. With this skull from the south, and these later finds also from southern China, we're clearly dealing with modern people. And right at the end of the Ice Age are the people from the upper cave at Dragonbone Hill, showing many of the features of modern Asians. And finally, the skull of a modern Chinese. Like the teeth we saw that were a million years old, these incisors are shovel-shaped, as are all the teeth that are incisors that are preserved in the fossils in between. It's a clue to the remarkable continuity in this sequence of Chinese fossils. This feature, and indeed this whole lineup, is relevant to a major argument that's going on at present amongst anthropologists as to where modern humans originated. Some people think it must have been in Africa where the first man-like creatures appeared. Others think it was somewhere else, like Europe. I'm one of those who think that the major modern groups, Africans, Europeans and Asians, developed pretty much in the areas where they are now. And that what this sequence of fossils shows is that modern Asians developed here in Asia. And it was from Asia that they began to move out into the whole Pacific Basin. With the lower sea levels at the end of the Ice Age and some form of watercraft, modern people from Asia colonised major islands out in the Pacific for the first time, the Philippines and Indonesia. Eventually, they moved even further out. The early modern Asian people continued the hunting and gathering way of life, finding an easy living in most places. We often think of Homo sapiens, modern humans, as people with a sophisticated technology. And yet the technology that we've been clever enough to invent has been much less important to our survival and success than our capacity to live together in groups, to cooperate with one another. That cooperation produced the complexity of human cultures. In many places, groups remained small and scattered. 
but in other areas, especially on the sea, large communities made an easy living from the abundant resources that were available. Here the ocean provided a constantly replenished source of food and materials for a full life. Along the north coast of Borneo, in places like Semporna, markets reflect the inexhaustible supply of food provided by the ocean. Around the South China Sea, from Thailand to the Philippines, many communities have put down roots. Some, like the Baja people of Sabah, in the sea itself. These villages are virtually self-contained communities. They sit on coral reefs, only a few kilometres from the nearest land, but children born here may not visit the mainland until they're teens. There are no doctors, no schools, no government services or bureaucracy here. They're outside the system. Sea gypsies speak their own dialect, which is incomprehensible to people on the nearby islands, but which links them to similar communities great distances away. People move back and forth from one sea village to another. Trade links them too, with island-based communities a day's boat trip away. The reef on which this village stands is so productive that the people are able not only to feed themselves with ease, but to send valuable shipments of seafood to market. They exchange fish and shell for the few things they can't provide for themselves. Sago, tobacco and metal tools.
Some people are so attached to the sea that they never leave it. The sea gypsies of Malaysia and the Philippines spend their entire lives on their boats. Although the Bajar fishermen and their families are citizens of Malaysia, other communities of these people live across the Sulu Sea in the Philippines, and they move freely back and forth. The fish recognize no territorial boundaries, and nor, it seems, do the Bajar. Inland people adapted to a different set of conditions. Fishing in the rivers and lakes, hunting in the forests, and gathering the seasonal fruits and edible plants. These groups usually had a major home base too, and developed a communal way of life centered on the longhouse like the Dayak people of Sabah. Life in a longhouse is very public. There's a line of small family rooms along one side of the building, like a motel, and a large working area on the other. The work area is the community centre, a place for art and craft and learning and conversation. Fifty people live in this longhouse, and some of them are much larger. Women make reed baskets, weave cloth, and prepare the food. The men make baskets and organize community life and trade. This is a cashless society. They depend on barter for the few things that they cannot produce for themselves.
but it was the islands that were the key to the extraordinary variety of human cultures in Southeast Asia. The tens of thousands of islands, large and small, in what is now Malaysia, Indonesia and the Philippines. With the changes in sea levels over 50,000 years, the islands grew and joined, shrank and disappeared. Populations expanded and dispersed, fused and broke up, found new ways to live as conditions altered. There were always new ways to feed and clothe themselves, and a thousand ways to express emotion and creativity. The sameness of modern Western life makes us forget the individuality of small-scale island cultures. <laughs> Family groups, small clans, whole tribes had time to develop artistic skills, music, ceremonies and ways of dressing. They made work, like the teasing and spinning of cotton, into a celebration. Eventually, people filtered through these islands, and by 50,000 years ago, perhaps earlier, groups began to land and settle the continent of Greater Australia. We still don't know exactly who they were, or which routes they took to reach Australia, but from discoveries of human fossils in Australia, it's clear that many of these first settlers were from Indonesia. They show the mark of ancient Java very clearly. The best evidence of these Ice Age people comes from southern Australia at a place called Cow Swamp that I excavated in the early 1970s. I found Cow Swamp because large-scale earth moving for irrigation works had exposed an ancient burial ground. The remains of more than 40 individuals were disturbed. The excavation showed that these people lived in this area at the end of the Ice Age, 10 to 15,000 years ago. They lived around a lake, collecting fish, tortoises and shellfish. They buried their dead with careful ceremony. The ancestors of these early Australians brought with them the biological and cultural heritage of Ice Age Indonesia. Many of the features of Java Man, the heavy brow ridges, the receding forehead, the large projecting face and teeth, were carried through into the people from Cow Swamp. It's a link with Java that spans hundreds of thousands of years. Three hundred kilometres northwest of Car Swamp, near the edge of the desert, there's a different kind of landscape. Eroding sand dunes preserve what's left of this part of an earlier Australia. 
evidence of extinct animals and altered climates. Anthropologists have known for a long time that many of the physical features of Australian Aborigines could be traced back to Ice Age Indonesia, ultimately to Java Man. They've also been pretty sure that that wasn't the whole story. And the first good evidence that there was another major element in the physical and cultural development of Aborigines was found here in Western New South Wales. This is Lake Mungo one of a chain of dry lake beds that 20 to 40,000 years ago was a series of large freshwater lakes full of fish and shellfish. A number of skulls and skeletons have been found here over the last 15 to 20 years. And this is a cast of the first one that was found. As you can see, it's quite small, very delicate and thin. The skulls and skeletons of the people who were fishing and camping around these lakes are quite unlike the robust looking people from Cow Swamp. The people who lived here were very modern looking, just like the people who were migrating out of China into Ireland Southeast Asia at this time. Clearly, some of those sea travellers reached Australia. What I think this means is that we are seeing in Australia the descendants of both Java Man and Peking Man. This skull is virtually identical to late Ice Age skulls that we saw earlier in Beijing. Once here, these two strains of people mixed together in different ways in different parts of the continent over tens of thousands of years until they produced the modern Aborigines. It seems Australia was the first continent to be discovered and settled by human beings across a real water barrier. The people arriving by sea from the islands of Southeast Asia, Indonesia and the Philippines, and ultimately from mainland Asia itself. Those first arrivals found a vacant continent, and their descendants spread out and adapted to this vast and really surprisingly variable country, each of its different environments slowly changing through time. Next, we'll see how over more than 50,000 years, those hunter-gatherers, the first Australians, perfected their own unique way of life. 